and welcome to Lunchbox Lessons with Story Crossing State Historic Site. I'm Dave, you're the audience, and we're pretty excited about this program as we welcome Aaron Tobin, who serves as a Preservation League of New York State's Vice President for Policy and Preservation and has been with the League since 2007. Aaron directs all aspects of the League's public policy and technical services programs. She works collaboratively to set and pursue statewide policy agenda that advances historic preservation in New York State at the federal, state, and local levels, builds and maintains a statewide coalition to assist the League in achieving its goals. Aaron also oversees the League's technical services and preservation grants programs, including oversight of the Seven to Save Endangered Properties Program and all preservation workshops and community outreach. She's held positions with the Massachusetts Historical Commission, New York State Landmarks Conservancy, and Historic Albany Foundation. She also serves on the City of Albany Historic Resources Commission, which she was appointed to in August of 2018. She holds a Master's of Science in Historic Preservation from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Arts in Archaeological History from Binghamton University. She lives in the City of Albany with her husband, three children, and Labradoodle. So please join me in welcoming Aaron Tobin. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Dave, I, I really appreciate the invitation to be with you uh, today. And um, I was going to have my video on, but I think I'm going to keep it off just to make sure WebEx can get a little wonky. Um, I'm at home and um, to make sure the connection stays strong. Uh, but it, I'm excited to be here today. And the uh, the Labradoodle mentioned in my bio is sitting in the room here with me. And sometimes he likes to talk when I talk. So hopefully. Um, please excuse any barking that might uh, that might happen in the course of this presentation. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here, and I am uh, here to talk a little bit about what the Preservation League of New York State is and what we do. Um, here you, on this slide, you can see our mission statement. We work across the the state in all of our 62 counties. Um, on a variety of programs, and I like this site because it shows all kinds of different buildings, including that uh, sweet little row in, in Fort Plain, uh, you know, so a little Montgomery County representation there, and the Amsterdam uh, Public Library. Uh, so we have, a, we have a lot of love for the, uh, for the Mohawk Valley here at the Preservation League. Um, so what do we do? Um, this uh, this map uh, is is a little bit uh, dated in terms of our uh, you know where we've been, but every year looks a lot like this. Uh, we work, like I said, all over the state. So um, every single corner in this map does a good job of showing um, all those different corners of the state. And um, we have a variety of programs that I'm going to go through with you and talk a little bit about. Um, how preservation can benefit you and your community. Uh, and we couldn't do what we do at the Preservation League without um, our partnerships and colleagues. And this is just a sampling of the um, mostly uh, public, but also private uh, partnerships and colleagues uh, that we work with, um, you know, every day, every week throughout the year. Um, and uh, certainly the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation is one of our biggest uh, partners and colleagues in supporting and promoting historic preservation and, uh, and telling the story of our history through our built environment. One of the programs that we uh, have is our preservation colleagues, and this brings together our nonprofit colleagues from around the state. Um, you can see this map with uh, different dots where we have colleague organizations across New York State. And here um, on the left is a picture of our colleagues coming together for a governmental advocacy day. Um, this is back when we all could walk the, the halls of the Capitol and talk to our uh, state elected officials about why historic preservation is so important. Uh, we offer technical services and outreach, and here, actually, this slide has a picture of Francis Stern, who's now with the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, um, giving a presentation on uh, historic preservation and why it's uh, so important um, in the city of Jamestown. Uh, and then you can see uh, this is a resource that's found on our website about small-scale solar panel installation um, that my colleague Christina Hingle, our public policy manager, uh, put together. And so we have a variety of resources. We'll come to your community. We'll give virtual talks like this one. 
Um, and then we have a lot on our website that can help if you're thinking, uh, you know, gosh, I have a historic building. Am I able to put a solar panel on it? The answer is yes, um, but, you know, do it thoughtfully. And these guidelines have some examples of that. And we have a lot more uh, technical advice on our website and, you know, on similar types of issues. Um, every other year, we have a biennial seven to save program. Um, these, uh, this slide gives a snapshot of our current seven to saves, our 2020, 2021 seven to saves. Um, and uh, if you're coming from or focused on Montgomery County uh, or the environs around Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site, then um, the Erie Canal. Uh, is our is the seven to save that might speak to you the most, but we have a variety this year and you can find all of this on our website. It's there's uh, an African American burial ground in Queens, the Hudson Athens Lighthouse in the Hudson River, uh, Central High School in Syracuse, uh, the Sag Harbor Hills, Azarest and Nineveh subdivisions um, in Sag Harbor in Suffolk County, way out on the east end of Long Island. Um, the New York State Barge Canal System, uh, a parrot architectural installation uh, which by uh, artist Richard, late artist Richard Lippold, which was hung in Philharmonic Hall at Lincoln Center for years until Lincoln Center took it down and put it in a box to be stored. Um, and then Parrot Hall, um, also owned by uh, the Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation in Ontario County in the city of Geneva. Um, a little bit. So, you know, you may wonder about the New York State Canal System. Uh, those of you who are seeing this, uh, you know, again, focusing on, you know, our, our efforts in this region, um, we really feel like it's important that any investment in the canal system honors its history and heritage and its most important functioning as a, a system, as a canalway, Canal corridor that has operated continuously since its creation over, you know, since the, the Erie Canal was dug 200 years ago. And we're in its bicentennial time period because, of course, it took it took years to, to build. And we want to make sure uh, while we applaud uh, the state's investment in the canals, we want to make sure that it continues to operate and function uh, across the state. Um, we have also highlighted uh, um, endangered historic vessels, and this is the Urger, which is shown here in Dry Dock in, in Waterford. Um, this was a really the canal system's flagship uh, tugboat and uh, used to be called uh, the teaching tug. It would travel up and down the canal system uh, where school kids could have field trips and learn about the Erie Canal and and the Champlain and, and Seneca Cayuga Canals and Oswego Canal and, and what that did and how important that was to the founding and development of New York, to the development rather of New York State. Um, I, about three years ago, uh, the New York Power Authority suggested that um, that this, uh, the, the urger be pulled up and um, buried in the ground or put on stilts at uh, the visitor center heading west on I-90. Um, and we didn't think that was the best thing for this historic vessel. We generally believe in preservation that the best purpose is the historic purpose and the historic use. And, um, and if not, then it should stay as close to that as possible, um, which would mean putting her back in the water. So fortunately, she's still a dry dock. We have been a part of a, a coalition um, to try to come up with um, some solutions to preserve her for a couple of years. and. Um, it remains to be seen still what her fate is. Um, and of course, uh, two years before that, we listed the Schoharie Aqueduct on our seven to save. And this was, um, it, this has been just a really delightful effort um, to call attention to and bring resources to this National Historic Landmark. It's actually a dual National Historic Landmark, the Schoharie Aqueduct stands on its own as an NHL. A National Historic Landmark is the highest level of designation for historic sites in our country. It rises above um, your, you know, your average historic building um, to really be of national significance. Um, so this, uh, it stands on its own. 
but then it's also part of the New York State Canal System National Historic Landmark Historic District. So um, it's it's twice over a, a National Historic Landmark. Um, of course, it sadly has lost lost its arch some of its arches, and we're focused on putting uh, you know stabilizing it. And happily, uh, the state has invested. Um, significant funds and will continue to invest um, over the next year or so significant funds in that stabilization. So this is very much of a partnership with the Preservation League and New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation and the New York State Canal Corporation, who's also invested funds um, to call attention to the aqueduct and provide better way, you know, more wayfinding signs and a smoother path to get to the aqueduct. Um, as well as nonprofit partners in the Erie Canal National Heritage Corridor and Canal Society of New York State, um, our own Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site, uh, Montgomery County, uh, um, Representative Tonko's office, uh, really the gamut um, has come together to support our um, Schoharie Aqueduct. And I can talk more about that maybe after the presentation. If we have a chat, I'd, be, I'd love to talk more about where that is right now, um, Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site is undergoing a master plan, um, and that's a parallel effort with the stabilization of the aqueduct and the funds that will be invested um, in stabilizing her and um, making sure that the aqueduct can can live on in future generations. Um, now we also have an excellence in historic preservation awards and one of our favorite things is when a building goes from a seven to save and then gets an award and this is an example. Um, we had our seven to save program. It was founded it began in 1999 and 20 years later this building in in the city of Rochester won an our excellence in preservation award. So it was a 20 year effort to save this building. Um, you know, preservation is a long game. Uh, and there's lots of starts and stops, but uh, you really have to persevere and um, not ever give up hope. Um, another exciting thing we've been doing is with support from the 1772 Foundation, we've been looking at vacant and underused buildings along the canal corridor. So um, the, over the last year and a half or so, we've traveled um, from Whitehall all the way out to Niagara County um, to look at uh, buildings that um, are close to the canal, uh, close to the Empire State Trail, and think about how they might be reused or repurposed. Um, so here you have the building on uh, in Albion um, out in Orleans County, and this is uh, on the right is in Brockport, um, which I'm not sure still exists. I hope it does, but um, we uh, um, that that's one that I was fairly concerned about and that that's in Brockport in Monroe County, just west of Rochester. Um, we also have had um, uh, other kind of exciting special projects we do. We had a survey of opera houses across New York State, and this is an ongoing one. We have a Google map and um, we would love to hear of more. Um, it's on our website and um, it's kind of a crowdsource project where we pick out, you know, we want to call attention to opera houses across the state. It's a very important building type that's really found in every community um, from the very rural small towns to, um, to the big cities. Um, so this one is, a, I, I particularly like this Waterville Opera House in Oneida County in the historic district there. Um, uh, and we're currently working on a project on a different opera house in Buffalo. Um, and to be clear, we're defining opera houses as buildings with an auditorium on the upper floor. So um, it's kind of opera house in quotes. It doesn't have to have been built specifically for that because a lot of times, you know, fraternal lodges or music halls or, you know, buildings by that went by other names serve to that same purpose of, you know, mixed use uh, entertainment on the upstairs and often storefronts on the first floor, um, sometimes with even apartments upstairs too. Um, uh, last year, we got funding from the Northern Border Regional Commission to award, I think, our first ever capital grants. Uh, we awarded uh, grants to four projects um, in the North Country through our Northeast Heritage Economy Program. 
Um, so this was a one off program um, and these are the projects in uh, at Adirondack experience in Blue Mountain Lake um, at the way in Waylandsburg. This is Whitcomb's garage in uh, the Trudeau house in historic in Saranac Lake and the Oneida community mansion house. Um, and uh, so we would love to see this program continue. Uh, like I said, it was a specific pot of money that the federal government had and. Um, we're not sure that it will continue, but we uh, would love to see um, this program uh, live on so that we could award more projects. It's great to be able to give capital grants because that's often what most people are looking for is bricks and mortar money. Um, we have another grant program to fund feasibility studies. Again, this is another annual. We just really fund one a year to um, for a consulting project um, on a historic building. This is a uh, the Uptown Center for Creative Arts in Utica got funding for a feasibility study. Um, we also have given them grants for code analysis. Um, and um, consulting grants are really a big part of what the Preservation League does. And again, we can't do it without our partners, primarily funded through the New York State Council on the Arts. Um, but our programs also get support from the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation, um, the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area, and then in past years, we also got support from the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor. Um, and these technical assistance grants, um, uh, so we have two different programs, uh, our technical assistance grant program and our Preserve New York. Our technical assistance grants, um, we uh, can, we support uh, only nonprofits and municipalities uh, that own or have a long term lease on their building. Um, we give a maximum award of $5,000 uh, and these can be grants can be used for uh, a variety of projects. Hazardous materials report, condition report, uh, feasibility study. Uh, um, we funded um, in at the Nellis Tavern in Montgomery County. Uh, conservator uh, study of the historic stenciling on the inside. So we there's a lot of creativity, in, but it must be a consulting report and it must go to a nonprofit or municipal entity that owns or has a long-term lease on its building and have that building be used for an arts or cultural purpose. Um, and these are just some examples of the kinds of projects that we can fund. Um, just this past year, we funded a feasibility reuse study for this pump station um, in the Stockade Historic District. Our Preserve New York program, which has been around since 1993, another NISCA partnership. Um, also, the applicants uh, for uh, the reports must own the building or have a long-term lease. We fund um, historic structure reports, cultural landscape reports, building condition reports. Um, you may recognize uh, the, some of these places if you know Montgomery County. Um, we also fund uh, building our cultural resource surveys. So for example, in Fultonville, we funded the study that led to the Fultonville Historic District, and then we funded the Historic District nomination itself. Um, our public policy program seeks to uh, advocate for effective preservation policies at the local, state, and national level. Again, this was February 2020, just before just before we uh, had the shutdown. And there's there's my dog saying hello, uh, and uh, and we really um, principally advocate for our historic tax credits. And historic tax credits are a great a financial incentive for rehabilitating historic buildings. And you can see here on the left that our historic tax credits um, have a tremendous impact in New York State. Um, they incentivize millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of rehabilitation, generating um, you know, a significant percentage of federal, state, and local taxes as a result of that investment, as well as creating jobs. Um, and as well as um, increasing income earned and uh, and uh, economic development. Sorry. Um, in New York State, we're really lucky because we have a state historic tax credit program. Um, we have two components to that. There's a federal tax credit and a state tax credit. Um, so our New York State tax credit program for income producing properties piggybacks on a federal tax credit. And, um, and we give talks about 
historic tax credits. Uh, we uh, put together workshops with our state historic preservation office that are, you know, can be up to two or three hours. So I'm giving you the very, very broad brush overview. There are a lot of resources about this on our website and also on the um, state parks website. And so if you have a building that is in a historic district or is uh, individually listed and is in a census tract that qualifies um, for, uh, you know, where the median income is at or below the state median income, you can qualify for a historic tax credit if that property is income producing. Um, so say you have a, a let's use that Fultonville building as an example, uh, where you have some apartments and some storefronts and you need to do a $5 million project on that building. Um, well, then you can qualify if, if the work you're doing meets the preservation guidelines. Um, you can qualify for a million dollars in federal tax credits and a million dollars in state tax credits. And the way those tax credits tend to work is that you go, you seek an, a partner who's an investor who can use those credits and then invest capital back into your project. Happily, just this year, we increased that state credit for small projects because those smaller projects under two and a half million have a hard time finding those investors. There's legal fees involved with setting up this kind of partnership and, um, you know, it needs to be worth their while to make that kind of investment. So let's take that project example I gave you and let's say that, that it was actually a $1 million project, not a $5 million one. Well, if it's a million dollar project, you get a $200,000 federal historic tax credit and you get a $300,000 state historic tax credit. And there you've just got 50% of your project paid for through historic tax credits in a dollar for dollar value. Um, now, when you get an investor, typically that value goes down slightly, but um, it's still a really good deal. And it's been a very powerful um, incentive for rehabilitation and economic development in our historic communities upstate. Um, now, if you have a historic home, let's keep using your Fultonville example and you have a house in Fultonville. Um, or really, I think almost all of those villages uh, along uh, in Montgomery County along the canal corridor are historic districts. Uh, and you need to put a new roof on your house or you need to do some porch repair or you need a new boiler or you need to upgrade your uh, electrical system and put in a new box um, or you need storm windows. All those things could qualify for the state historic homeownership tax credit. You have to be in a historic district or individually listed. Um, you have to be in a qualifying census tract. You have to live in the house. It has to be your owner occupied residence. But let's say this, pro these, this work is going to cost you $20,000. You're going to get $4,000 of that back as a state historic tax credit, which again, that's a dollar for dollar. So when you go to file your taxes, if you owe $4,000, you're going to you don't have to pay that. And if you've already paid in your income for four, you know, $4,000 on your income tax, you're going to get that money back. So that's a pretty good deal. Um, if your adjusted gross income is at or below $60,000, the credit becomes a rebate. So that if you don't have that kind of income tax liability, you'll just get a check in the mail for it. And um, that's it. That's me. There's my, um, that's my work phone number. Um, I'm mostly on cell these days, but that work number will get you to my cell. And uh, my email address, preservenys.org, is, um, is our website to go to. And I will stop sharing. There we go. Uh, so yeah, I, I see Dave put in the chat whether uh, asking if there are any questions. Um, are there any questions? When it comes up from from Gina, and I'll do this in, that way. There's, I'll, I'll mention the questions that are posted. Uh, it works a little better on later on if we post this to YouTube for for people to to hear it as well because uh, they can't see the the chat. But uh, Gina's asking where she could find the Opera House map on your website? Great question. I am going to, uh, I can post it in the chat and then once I find it, I will 
Um, so it's on our it's on our blog, and I'll see if there's a way to. I don't know if if it's posted elsewhere. Um, so if you go to our website and you go to blog, um, you can search and find it. So I, I'm sharing mine. I'm up on the website now. I'm blog. And so somewhere on this, there would be that list. Um, right. Yes. Right here. Yeah, we use the search function and I'll see if we can find if we can have a better um, more direct way to get to it. But um, after how does it work? That's it. So hopefully that answered Gina's question. That looks like there is yep, there it is of opera houses all across New York. Interesting concentrations in the population densities, and uh, you could probably extrapolate all sorts of reasonable assertions about why and where these are located in transportation and population hubs. Um, and I'm just going to zoom in right here. You mentioned the one about in this area, also the one in Glenwood. That's great. For those that are are watching, that are are local, uh, that's this is a I'm going to. Probably wind up on this website again later today, just kind of looking at everything that you have on here. <laughs> it's you can um, spend a lot of time having fun with that. Uh, I, I've I've, uh, I've dug in, and it's 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 pretty fun, and it's also not comprehensive. We know there's um, plenty that are we don't have on there um, because, of course, to take the time to drive every street to find um, every opera house would take a very long time. So we really do count on people to let us know, um, you know, what ones we've missed. And I, I have a, a few minutes here if uh, anybody else has any other questions they want to put in the chat. But uh, so just since we're kind of on the topic of the website and everything that there's there's a mailing list that people can be notified of either upcoming programs or other, you know, they can, they can sign up for your e-newsletter. Yes, absolutely. And I think if you scroll down a little bit on that website that you have up, there's a spot to sign up for the email list right there. And then you'll get, we have a monthly, we don't inundate anybody, but we have a, a monthly e-newsletter. And then we send out alerts and important information as it comes up. Um, we also have a monthly book club, which is a lot of fun and has, um, uh, we've just read some really great books. Uh, uh, James Baldwin's uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain is the one we're reading right now. Um, I really enjoyed it because there's there's a lot of books that I wanted to read that um, this really pushed me to make sure I did read. And then some books that I didn't, hadn't really even known about, like The City We Became, which was a, just such a great book. Um, uh, and uh, and so it's it's fun. I encourage everyone to join us. Very good. And is that, is that kind of posted through one of those book club, uh, uh, there's a like, hosting site for some book club that helps you there? Is that all preservation with the in-house operator? It's um, yeah, it it's post it's shared on our e news, and then if you follow us on Facebook or on Instagram, you'll get all of these notices. So um, so it goes up as an event on our Facebook site. It's always in our Instagram feed or one of our Instagram stories, um, and that's how you can find out more information about joining. And uh, another another question that I had. Um, could you just, you mentioned the 1772 Foundation. Could you just give a couple of lines and kind of explain what that is? Sure. That's a foundation that's based in Connecticut and they fund historic preservation projects, um, mostly in the Northeast, but really across the country. And um, we've been, we've kind of had a, a soft opening of uh, that program. We haven't done a big announcement on it yet, but 
Um, it's it's a really wonderful foundation that often supports revolving loan program or revolving funds, loan programs, um, and uh, regrants. Um, so, for example, right now they are supporting a, a four state partnership or multi state partnership in New England um, for New England statewide to give capital grants. So it's the sort of thing. Um, it's a it's a lovely foundation, and it, um, we're very uh, grateful for their generosity. And I, I'm glad you made the point too that a lot of the work that you do really does, you know, it's partnerships and it's, it's really partnership based. A lot of the stuff uh, along the canal way and in New York State, obviously, you need uh, friends in many different locations, high places, low places, anywhere in between. Um, but if there was somebody tuning in for this or watching the video that was part of an organization, let's say that they, they feel like there's a lot of value in what the Preservation League does. And they want to get their organization involved in a partnership. And they reach out to you, or is there is there somebody else they need to talk to? Um, they can reach out to me, uh, and we have our our manager of technical and grant programs is Jana Rudler, uh, and so you can contact Jana as well, um, or Christina Hingle, who's our preservation policy manager, and she runs our preservation colleagues program. So really, any of the preservation league staff. Um, even, even our communications and development staff, you know, we're, we're only 8 people, uh, and we all talk very regularly. So, um, you know, if you, if you don't get the right person, whoever you get, will will put you in touch with, with the person you need to speak with, you know, um, I'm, I'm always happy to be a clearing house for, for those kinds of inquiries. And, and yes, uh, like. So many of the great organizations doing a tremendous amount of work. It's a small staff, and I guess the benefit of that is if something shows up in your inbox that belongs to better than somebody else's, you know exactly who they reach out to, and they might be sitting right there in your office with you. Uh, exactly. So, uh, Hal sends in this message, uh, and I, I know it came in privately, Hal, but I'm going to mention it anyway. But he did a wonderful photographic shoot at the Nellis Tavern for their stencils. And I'm mentioning it because I'm gonna give a shameless plug to that. The Nellis Tavern in Montgomery County in the St. Johnsville area off of uh, Route 5. Uh, they're only open a few hours on Sundays uh, during the summer, but they are definitely worth checking out. And that stencil project is absolutely amazing. So the preservation they did uh, wonderful assistance to them and, and the board carried that through. And it's a marvelous project. And there, I know that they're doing work on the outside of the building currently. Uh, but it's it's definitely worth checking out if you're coming through the valley. Yes. Uh, yeah, there is there is such a rich history in Montgomery County that um, you know it's so worth getting off the throughway and taking a drive on Route Five or Five S and exploring the communities um, as well as the the gems like the Nellis Tavern. Yeah, and, and there's, you know, you do it this time of year, there's an ice cream stop um, just about everywhere. So you can check out the history of an ice cream cone. Um, and, and it makes for a, a great way to spend your weekend. Absolutely. Uh, another shameless plug that I'm going to you mentioned the United Community Mansion House. Uh, and for folks that are interested in more about that on our YouTube, it is a wonderful part of, uh, well, it's from our New York State History Month series. There's a video on there if you want to learn about the United Community and uh, the work that they do out there. It also took me a moment to realize when you're talking about the Adirondack experience, that you're talking about the Adirondack Museum, because I still think of it in what its name used to be. But the experience at Blue Mountain Lake is a wonderful place to check out some of the history of the Adirondacks as well. So I'm glad that the preservation and involvement up there is, is strong. Yes. Let's see, and, and I have a question here, and this might be a slightly unfair question, um, but, but you're a parent, and so I feel like you can understand that this question is sort of like asking to, to choose which of your children is your favorite. But in your in your time in the Preservation League and your involvement, particularly with Seven Disabled, has there been one particular project that you could identify as your favorite, and where is that project now? Oh boy, oh boy, it is like picking my children. That's so hard. Um, well, I'll say this year, 
and and this year I'm going to cheat and say that this year there's two that I have invested um and the preservation league has invested considerable sum of money and time and effort and heart and soul into working on and that's the New York State Canal System and Parrot Hall in Geneva. Um, I would say Scoheri Aqueduct comes right up as like the runner up in that um, and uh, and Scoheri Aqueduct uh, is probably the least you know, I, I'm, I'm the most optimistic about it. So um, maybe I'm, I'm giving the extra love to the, the seven to saves that I worry about the most. Um, but I, I really, I really love those. I'll say one of my favorite seven to saves, which is a great success story, is up in Plattsburgh. It's the old stone barracks in, in Plattsburgh on the Air Force Base. And it was, um, uh, you know, built as barracks up on the base up in Plattsburgh overlooking uh, Lake Champlain. Beautiful building and um, it was threatened. Uh, and um, and actually, Dave, if you want to stop screen sharing, I can pull that up on our website and show people pictures of it. Um, let's see. Um, because it is now Valcor Brewing and is, uh, okay, let's see, share Google Chrome. Um, I can show a picture of it. So that's a fun one because um, it's a great success story, and we love um, success stories, and I think it was this one. Yep, Old Stone Barracks, so here, uh, 1838 building, um, there was real concern um, after decades of vacancy that it would be demolished, but now you can go there and you can have a delicious meal and a pint of beer or soda or iced tea or whatever one's favorite beverage might be um and i uh, you know it's nice to have a, a just a really lovely place to be um in plattsburgh and so this is i really like this one because it's such a lovely success story and it's all about um private entrepreneurship meeting historic preservation and i think that's so much of what we do um so i encourage Anyone watching this and everybody here, if you're driving up the Northway and you're hungry around Plattsburgh, stop at Valcor Brewing and um, grab yourself a bite to eat. And I'm just making sure, you know, these days, <laughs> these days we worry about places still being around, um, but it looks like it's still, it's still with us um, even through COVID. So that's good news. That is, that is really great. And, um, I, I guess the point that I was thinking in, in hearing that it's sort of that you know, the entrepreneurial spirit and, and that kind of uh, leverages itself in various ways for these different projects and these different grants and these tax credits. And, and my assumption would be, uh, maybe you could speak to it just, just a little bit, that once that ball kind of gets rolling in a historic district or a community uh, and you can showcase those success stories, that that becomes sort of like, it's a, is there a snowball effect that kind of once happening or do you find that a lot of these communities that, that kind of take advantage of these, that they, they really, they nurture and foster that even within themselves? Yes, um, there is absolutely a snowball effect. And, um, and I think it was actually the village of Little Falls that really hit the ground running with historic tax credits and the homeowner tax credit early on. Um, that historic homeowner tax credit has been around in its current iteration for 11 or 12 years. And um, there's a neighborhood in Little Falls that started using it, um, you know, 10 or 11 years ago. And, you know, one neighbor started using it and then told the other neighbor how easy it was and they did it. Um, and that's what we've seen across the state. So out in Buffalo, um, that's the, you know, that's kind of the go-to success story where it's just 
once people know how easy it is to use the homeowner tax credit, um, they're so excited uh, to qualify and to get that incentive and that, that money for their investment in their historic house. Um, and then similarly with the uh, uh, commercial credit and you know, the income producing credit, you know, once a developer figures out how to use it, they're usually pretty hooked because it is such a great um, financial incentive, um, but there's definitely, I think, a, a hurdle, um, both real and mental, and, um, you know, the unknown and not knowing how to use it, not knowing if it would really work, not, you know, not having the connections with investors. So um, it is one of those things that the, the more you use it, the easier it gets, and then people just love it um, and really don't, you know, focus their projects on that sort of thing. It's always nice when there's a success story. Um, and the unfortunate thing is I'm sure there's several times where it's not a success, but I think that focusing on the positives and the successes is more what I'd run to do right now. Uh, and, yeah. and then in that, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of expand. You mentioned before about the stabilization project for the aqueduct and how we're moving forward with that. The last information I believe we were on the call as well, but, uh, the state is allocating resources to it. Montgomery County uh, had uh, received a large grant that's being put into it. Uh, plenty of other partners, like the Greek, now a National Heritage Board or Preservation of New York, now Society of New York. Uh, and we're all uh, still taking those steps toward the stabilization and then perhaps a little bit more of the phase two project, but we have to get the phase one done first. Uh, contract should be going out fairly soon. And we'll see where it kind of goes. Projected timeline from that, my understanding is sometime in uh, late fall for the, the on the ground work to begin. Um, so we're, we're kind of waiting to see what that um, call for proposals really kind of gives us and, and who we're going to get to do the work. And it's pretty darn exciting, actually. So I'm, I'm glad that you have some enthusiasm behind it. And I know that a lot of the other folks that come out to visit the site or are part of our partner organizations are also excited about it. And uh, in all of the strangeness that has been the last 18, 19 months, or however long it seems to have been, uh, it's kind of nice that we're going to potentially go into at least the end of this year with some really great preservation um, wins, some, some positives, and close out our 2020. Yes. Uh, so with, with that, uh, we're bumping up toward the end. Uh, there are no other questions coming through on the chat. I have expelled or extended all of the, the questions that I wrote down. Uh, I pulled up the calendar real quick here. It kind of looks like uh, you, you have book clubs and some other stuff coming up for the Preservation League and anybody that can sign up on here on the website or uh, anywhere else to kind of follow you on Instagram or, or uh, Facebook and all of your other social media. Uh, it's a good option. I do it. The site does it. And I highly recommend that. Um, Aaron, I, I want to thank you very much for taking the time uh, this afternoon as part of our Lunchbox Lesson Series here at School Harry Crossing to share with us what the Preservation League of New York does and, and to speak with me. That's super great. And, and I really, really do appreciate it. Uh, it's been fantastic. Thank you, Dave. I'm so uh, I'm so happy that I had this opportunity, and I'm really um, excited by the work at Schoharie Crossing. And I'm just going to put a plug in for your site because the Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site is a remarkable place um, with something for everyone. So I hope all those who are listening and are watching this, uh, if you know it's worth a trip. And if you've been, it's worth a repeat trip. So um, uh, thanks so much for inviting me here uh, this afternoon. Great. Thanks for that plug. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Be well, stay safe. Bye-bye.